Hello everyone, it's Joel Clark, publisher of Lone Wolf Fists. Um, I actually published the goddamn thing, look at me. I've actually recorded this video seven or eight times since releasing Lone Wolf Fist uh, in various states of vitamin D deficiency and unconsciousness. So I feel like I'm better now. I started taking supplements and my brain seems to be working again, so that's good. Uh, don't do keto in winter in Alaska. That's the takeaway from that. And speaking of Alaska, the planes have decided this is the time of the morning they're going to take off, so you're just going to have to listen to that all morning like I have to. Welcome to Anchorage. Anyway, um, so yeah, we we're actually getting some, some people actually playing Lone Wolf Fist and asking questions that people only ask when they are actually like running it at their table, and it's fucking awesome. I'm so stoked. I've, I've won. I've reached one of my victory conditions in life. I could die now a complete man. So that's good. I don't want to die because I want to keep making shit. But I, for now, I'm I'm pretty stoked. Um, I'm really stoked. People are running my game, and it's awesome. Uh, I did want to address some feedback I've gotten. I've gotten some really good feedback. Um, first of all, just to get it out of the way, uh, version 1.2, the, the hopefully the definitive PDF is coming down the pike. I'm going to start work on that on the 25th. That's right after Thanksgiving. Uh, this is part of my mandatory two-week break. I have already had a complete physical, emotional, and uh, psychological breakdown. Uh, so that was something I knew was probably going to happen after pushing myself as hard as I did for as long as I did. And I seem to be coming out of it. Um, I wrote a blog post about Call of Cthulhu. Um, I'm hoping to play that a little bit in the future to give myself a, a prolonged design break um, and just enjoy the hobby that I love. Because I do love it. I, I love role-playing. Um, but yeah, I want to I want to get 1.2 done next, and the feedback that I'm getting now, and any feedback I get between now and the 25th, and really probably afterwards too, is gonna help to shape that definitive edition. Uh, and definitive edition is gonna be mostly quality of life improvements. There's not a lot of errata that's necessary. A um, couple of little nips and tucks, um, but for the most part, I'm really happy with the way the rules work, and they seem to be functioning as intended. Um, for example, the the fight rules are. Uh, most of the bad guys you fight, including monsters and vehicles and uh, big groups of baddies and higher degree villains, all have this wonderful thing where they start out really powerful compared to the player characters, and then because of the way Prana works uh, and you consistently get more throughout a fight, this there's this inverse arc where two, three rounds in, the players are on par or surpassing the enemy, and then they're able to curb stomp them in those later rounds. And that's kind of great. It, it means that there's a sort of easy mode default way of playing this game where you're really evasive and defensive in early rounds, which really scans, dramatically speaking, uh, and makes the fights feel really tense. Um, and then, you know, in those later rounds, whenever you're powered up and ready to Goku those motherfuckers, you Goku them, and it's cathartic and satisfying. There's an emotional through line to fights, especially ones that are dangerous. Um, and there's a really good link between uh, setting resources and like the, the narrative importance of getting over something. Like Fighting a hundred-man army is really dangerous, and when you do it, it changes the world. Like It's, it's a significant setting change. Um, so that's great. Uh, th there's been a lot of feedback where people are, are kind of starting to encounter stuff that I've programmed into the game that's definitely not super obvious until you start playing it and, and thinking about it and being like, oh, oh wait, no, this is doing something. Um, and it's it's right in character gen. So I've, I've been curious about how people are going to react to this stuff. So far, there's been a lot of like disbelief about how powerful characters start and the goodies they get and all that stuff. And I wanted to make certain I was drawing everyone's attention to something because this also comes along with uh, another little, a little, little sleeper agent of mine that's in the character generation rules, which is money. There's money in most equipment packages. Almost every equipment package gets money. So that's cool. Um, and the question naturally, I, I think this is a completely fine question. Is well, how how do we use this money? What do we spend it on? Where's the where's the price list for things in this game? That's pretty hidden, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's pretty hard to find, and uh, it doesn't really give you a super straightforward answer, does it? Yes, it's the price the the cost and pricing list. Um, is way in a weird place in the domain section, like near the end of the domain section, when it's talking about building markets and how all that works. There's this big chart takes up most of the page, which is here's all the prices in the game. Here's how much different things cost. 
And when you look at that, it, it, the information in it isn't really straightforward. It's like, okay, so different eras of technology, depending on how developed the market is, give you different amounts of stuff you can buy for just for like just the silver standard. Well, that's interesting. Why is it that way? And then you, it kind of hits you. It's that way because you're not dealing with a setting that has a functional market or economy. There's no real stability in this world. Uh, it's it's a real patch job kind of place. Some markets you can buy stone axes uh, for you know five five silver coins a piece, and some places you can get tubes of of toothpaste stamped out of a factory, and that'll be you know one quarter of a silver piece. And the reason for that is because there's different levels of infrastructure in different places. Why are there different levels of infrastructure in places? Well, if you go through the domain rules and, and look at them, you realize it's because different warlords have different abilities to defend their territories and different amounts of money that they get for exploiting the things that are in those territories, you know, food or gold or whatever. And that trade is a great way to increase their wealth and give them the ability to get new things they didn't have access to before. There's also an interesting little swerve in that system where most of the really dangerous and powerful items, the ones that are really hard to come by, don't have a set price. They're bid items. They're, they're assumed to be bid on at, at black markets and secret auctions between power power holders in these, in these um, exchanges of, of power and wealth. So there's a lot going on about the setting right there in that chart. And that's by design. Oh, excuse me. It's meant to draw you into the way the game functions and the way the game's world functions, which has a lot of consequentiality because there's a lot of thought put into it. So, uh, so yeah. It's also meant to dissuade people who think about Lone Wolf Fist as a build system. That's one of two things in the character generation rules that is really supposed to make you leery about approaching this as a game where you have all these options in front of you and you just pick the your favorite ones to put together for your build. There's some of that. I mean, like, uh, you can certainly, whatever you choose a clan, you've got two different kung fu styles in front of you. You can mix and match pretty easily. So you can, to some degree, optimize. But the guys who are the best at that, the Ronin, suck. They really suck. Uh, they don't. They have the shittiest equipment package. Their background, their big background thing is that there's something in their past that puts a big target on them, and like they're really only able to start with a small amount of selection. They they technically have everything in that lower tier, but when you're actually doing the build there, you'll find there's not a lot of synergy between vastly disparate styles. It's sort of hard to scum the system. It doesn't really reward you for that. That's all by design. <laughs> it's, that's how I wanted it. It's it's a theme first game. The themes are things like I can control fire or I'm the world's greatest swordsman. Those are thematically cohesive. And I don't I think people don't expect that of me. I think they think of me as a mechanics guy and I really am. I'm a rules guy. But like I have the rules in the role playing game because I want to make something that is interesting that ultimately will have cool stories told about it. And a guy who found a few techniques that happen to have a unique and unexpected synergy can be a very cool story, right? That can be a cool thing that happens, that interesting stories can be told about. As a matter of fact, that's almost got to the point of being a trope in a lot of modern anime, where like there's the guy who kind of looks at it in that sort of build way. And I don't want to I don't wanna box that out of the game entirely. But I do want to make it clear that that's not the default state of play. The default state of play is to think about it in a very approachable way. I want to be a firebender is a completely approachable way to play this. Just like I want to be Kinshiro from Fist of the North Star is an approachable way to play this. There's no significant advantage that comes along with system mastery. System mastering is about playing the game in a clever way, not in participating in the character creation minigame pre-game in a clever way. Again, that's by design. So, it's... You're supposed to, whenever you look at some of the options and some of the benefits that you can have in this, you're really supposed to think about them in terms of the setting. And I know that seems, again, kind of counterintuitive, but, like, 
another one that was brought uh, to my attention was what if you have like a 20 ferocity monster because you you rolled super good and uh that's just the thing that you got as a as a emerald kyren and like yeah it's a really good point you could totally have like a stegosaurus or a triceratops you're stomping around on that's a really cool thing and i think it would be completely rad to have that as a as a starting character it's like having a a tank or a powerful magic sword would be super cool right but like um your tank needs fuel your triceratops needs food and it's in the environment that can sustain it when you start so you're not going to get far out of Panku with the Triceratops that isn't very, very hungry unless you have some renewable source of food or you have a way to get it an enormous amount of fodder because Triceratops eat a lot of food. They do. Um, they also do this thing where they paint a really big target on your back. If you have, like, the world-ending super sword, that rules. Um, also, everybody wants the world-ending super sword, and most people in the setting that want it are way more powerful than a starting character. So, and you might not boss fight those guys immediately, but you're going to deal with their minions a lot. And they're going to be like, why don't you come over to our side? The Mockingbird Emperor can reward you handsomely. You're going to have some real decisions to make as a character early on because you have the world ending super sword. I like that. Uh, every, every advantage is kind of counterbalanced by the fact that it exists within a setting where you're sort of always at war. Um, and I like that. That's by design. Uh, I actually meant for the game to work that way. And there are really big advantages that you can get just from character gen just because you rolled good. That's fine. I, nothing is insurmountably powerful. And uh, again, it's really about clever use of what you do have much more than just having a powerful thing. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot that fights against the idea that it's a build system, but I'm not totally opposed to it. I'm having my cake and eating it too. Why not? I can have another different distinct cake and eat one other cake. We all can. Let's enjoy our cake. <sighs> but yeah, so that's some of the feedback I got. A lot of the feedback is, is really functional stuff. Like, um, uh, there's a couple of places where the rules are a little cloudy. Like, platoons are a little cloudy. Uh, I, I think I've clarified them on the Discord. But, like, they went through a couple of different versions. Uh, the idea is that for every ten dudes in a platoon you get one die to roll in an effort pool, and you also get this kind of floating plus one bonus that you can apply to your rolls. Um, and my intent was for you to apply those bonuses right directly after you rolled, so in the early phases of the uh, of the turn, so you have like these larger sets that you could swing around later in the turn. Like That was the intent there, because I didn't really want to roll a bunch of individual d10 attacks. I actually made it so that most of the lone wolf fists had a passive defense that was high enough that if you did that, that it would suck. I uh, just, it wouldn't work. Um, because like they've got, you know, a 10, uh, as a, as a resting defense and you can get like, you know, up to 19 with a good punch. Um, so it's just, so if they use a single die to match you, or if you roll poorly, you can take a couple of hit points off with an individual dude. Um, and most lone wolfists get at least two or three points of armor, which makes them pretty, if not invincible to the low-level flunkies, at least considerably resistant to them. But they can still be dangerous. You can still group up and have like eight guys ambush someone, and, and, and eight effort pool, uh, eight health bad guy, even if they don't have any special claim to fame with techniques, is still pretty dangerous. Like, it's reasonably dangerous. A lot of lone wolfists only have like six effort to start off with, and so that's a little more interesting of a fight, you know? And uh, most most of the fights are, are balanced around there, somewhere in that range. Whew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like I said, I've I've done several versions of this. I always kind of scrap them because I'm kind of in like unsatisfied with them at the end. But mostly I'm just mostly I'm just kind of buzzing because my game's out there and people are actually talking about it. Um, I'm gonna use my last well, let's say minute. I'm gonna use my last minute here to. Uh, to thank everybody for everything that you guys have done so far. Um, version 1.2 is coming down the pike. Uh, like I said, uh, after Thanksgiving, I'm going to start working on it. Shouldn't be too long. Um, I've got some formatting stuff I want to fix up a little bit. Uh, I need to figure out how to add an index. I don't know how to do that, so it's going to be a thing. I'm, I can do the bookmarks. I looked that up. That doesn't seem too challenging. Um, in terms of bigger formatting changes, like there was some feedback about a lot of the, the blank space on pages. 
I'm probably gonna leave that. I, I really like the the blank space. It gives it it gives individual pieces of the text enough room to breathe, and it makes it feel a little bit more booky uh, having those extra pages. And they don't really ultimately add too much to it. Uh, earlier versions of the layout had the text a lot more cramped, and I found that made it harder to to absorb the ideas from the text. Um, so I, I'm pretty fine with the way they look right now. Um, there are some vague parts in the rules, I will admit to those. Some of them are unintentional, and of the unintentional, there's two variety. There are the ones where I'm like, ooh, I should probably clarify that. Then there's also the ones where it's kind of a happy accident, because the other things, the th ones that, that aren't non-intentional, the ones that are intentional, the intentional vaguenesses, are there because I want people to make this game their own. And there's a lot of valid ways to interpret some of those things. So really only about a third of the vagaries in the rules or a third of the categories are negative and that doesn't have a lot of membership um so there might be a little bit of tweaks here and there throughout the text but really for the most part i went over this several times with a fine tooth comb during the tech edit and again during layout and i was like let me see if i can't make this a little more clear um the most challenging chapter by a wide click that is the is the d domains chapter and the second most challenging one is actually the combat. Uh, the combat and the skills is pretty dense. But if you can get over the combat, you can definitely understand the domains. Um, now, whether or not you want to use the little the little game creation subsystem that it has, uh, whether that interests you is going to be up to personal taste. But there's a lot in domains that makes the game tick, and I would really recommend looking through at least the uh, the market part of that chapter and the the general structure of how a post-apocalyptic society functions because it tells you a lot about the setting and about the kind of uh, assumptions underlying how all the different clans work. It's really informative stuff. Uh, hopefully it's not too technical and dull to read. It, I, I tried to write it in an approachable way and so there's explanations that repeat several times throughout the chapter just to kind of help ease you into some of the bigger like wordier denser and a little more difficult to swallow ideas. For the most part, though, it should follow your intuition pretty well, which is to its benefit. Um, and all the systems in there should be pretty approachable and gameable. They really follow the kind of fiction-first model of you start with a cool idea description, and then later on you add just enough to it to give it some mechanical heft. Um, that's the way everything works. That's the way fields work. That's the way tracks work. That's the way everything works in this system. It's, it's all idea first and then you just give it just enough heft and enough framework to make it work um well that was way more than a minute um but yes okay i'm i'm getting scattered at this point because i'm extremely tired vitamin e deficiency will do that too um after the version 1.2 the next thing down the pike and i really hope to have this done very quickly is the hardback uh there's enough left in the kickstarter to get everyone their hardbacks out I just did the math this morning, and it was very sunny. Um, even if the 1.2 version, which I'm hoping will be the final version of the PDF and the text overall, uh, even if that adds like five or six pages, it's not going to alter the cost so much I can't afford to kick those all out. And also, I can pay my editor now, because we're a, a copper bestseller, and I actually made enough money off of that to pay him what I owe him. Um, I'm not going to just throw that at him. I'm going to dole it out a little bit slower, because I want to make sure that I've got. To, I still want to juggle and make sure everything from the Kickstarter gets delivered to backers too, and it might come out that I've I've messed up some math or or something might go wrong. I may have to reissue coupons or something. Whatever happens, I want to make sure I've got a little bit of a, a just enough poof underneath to make sure it can get out. Uh, but after all that said and done, uh, and I I pay Albert the money I owe him, which I do owe him money, and I'm I'm gonna pay him. Uh, then that will actually be able to put the kibosh on the Kickstarter once and for all and say, okay, it's out, it's done. Next project, um, and I'm very excited about that because this thing has been kind of looming for the last couple of years. Uh, it's been very difficult, and at some points I have been totally burned out. Um, hence this mandatory two-week hiatus to give myself some time to make my brain work again, uh, which has been nice because apparently I was vitamin D deficient. Again, that sucks. <sighs> yeah, I guess that's everything. Guys, thanks for everything. Uh, thanks from the bottom of my heart. This has been fantastic, and difficult and overwhelming and a really unique and interesting experience. I hope you're enjoying Lone Wolf Fist and um, I hope to see you in the Fistiverse or 
I, I don't know if people do forums anymore. I haven't been in forums in forever. But if you want to go talk about this, you'll be doing me a big favor. Uh, if you like what you see, if you have something that is recommendable to other GMs who want to do a, an idiot punch game of the highest caliber, you know, talk to them about it. Like, start that start that word of mouth. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, let's see if we can get a silver bestseller. That'd be rad. Uh, in any event, this is Joel Clark signing off. Thanks again. Goodbye. <laughs>